Noel and Jeremiah are the pastors of the Ebenezer Church. Uh, it's a church plant, and we have been involved in part of that. And it's just been a, a wonderful ministry that, that they are uh, doing and involving the entire community. So they're going to be preaching with us today, so let's give them a warm welcome. Oh, wait. No <laughs> yeah. 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 No, we gave no. everything we had in the first service. <laughs> I, know. I, I don't, know, I don't know why I'm clapping. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's because this is, going about to be, that. this is going to be the best moment of the whole entire experience. Of their lives, it goes, maybe. It goes down here from here. So I just want to clap for now. Like say. <laughs> Hey, family, you really are family. If you don't know about us, um, find out about us. We are an extension of you. We are an extension of your community over in a uh, small town called Linda Vista uh, in central San Diego, one of the six most distressed communities uh, in terms of, you know, the experience, our experience on the poverty line. And uh, we were praying that God would give us the tough places to minister in. And God blessed us with the Linda Vista. And it is crazy. <laughs> so I, w- I wanted to be here to let you know that I'm actually, I'm actually leaving the church. So thank you. It's been nice. It's, it's been, been nice. It's been great. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> it's African humor. You, you get it. You get it. <laughs> We're going to be in the, in the book of Acts. If you want to turn there, we'll be in chapter 19. And as you guys do, there's something that uh, I, I maybe just place in, in the back of your head. Because the Apostle John, years later, who was here in Ephesus, he was part of the Ephesian church, he, he writes back to them and, and first he commends them. You guys remember this in Revelation 2? He says, I, I see you. And I see your works and, and I see your deeds and, and I know you hold your teachers to high standards and, and I know you're, you're active and I know you, you work hard and you're persevering, but, but I have this against you. You've abandoned your first love. Remember, repent and do the things that you did at first. He writes, he, man, this guy, writes back to spiritual giants. And and it's just years past this scene that we're about to read. And he writes back to them, remember those days. Do those things that you did at first, which were, we're about to get into. So just keep that in, in the back of your mind as you, as you read this, because they were doing something that John later on calls them back to. And it's here in, in Acts 19. And just one more piece of context. We're going to start in verse 17, because I, I want you to see what happened. And, and what had just taken place was Paul going out, and as part of his ministry, healing and casting out demons... And these sons of Sceva saw that and said, we want a part of whatever Paul has. So they went around looking for folks possessed by demons, which is never a great idea. But they found one and they said, well, through the power of Paul's God and through the power of Paul, we command you to leave. And the, and the demon says, so funny, but it's in scripture, it says, well, we know Paul's God, and we know Paul, but who are you? <laughs> and they scrap, and Scripture describes to scrap like this. You just get the outcome. They get beaten and left naked. And if there is any doubt, if you lost the fight, if you leave the fight naked, you did not win. You did not, you did not win. win. <laughs> and word gets out. That's verse 17. And this became known through all the residents of Ephesus. Those are the naked guys. <laughs> they should have just, just left them alone. Both Jews and Greeks and, fell, and fear fell upon them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. And many of those who are now believers, listen, who are now believers, that's the key. They're now believers, came confessing 
repenting, divulging of their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to be 50,000 pieces of silver. And the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. This is what John is referring to. The word of God going out, the power of Jesus going out, and, and things begin to shift. Things begin to change. Verse 23. About that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. I just picture this scene. Folks are getting really mad. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know from this business we have our wealth. And you see in here that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying, this is the summary of Paul's message, saying that God's made with hands are not God's. And there is danger not only, listen to this prophecy, this guy, this guy knows, and there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing. Little did he know. And that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. When they heard this, they were enraged and cried out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with confusion, and they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Artaeus, Macedonians, who were Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. And even some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. Now some cried out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. We'll pause there. Mm -hmm. In the 1970s, maybe late 60s, 1970s, a, um, a scientist by the name of Dr. Thomas Kuhn presented a concept. And this concept um, was, was called a paradigm shift. A paradigm shift. The idea with the paradigm shift is that um, an idea can come into our world and change the way that we look at everything. An idea, one thing, one thing, one thing, can come into our world and it can change the way that we look at everything. When 9-11 happened, I was still back in Malawi, in Southeast Africa, in my home country. And I was a theology and broadcasting student. And so as a broadcasting student, they had sent us out to try and find stories that we can come and share with the class, the next class. There was no any other story that could be told the next class but the story of the two airplanes that crashed into the Twin Towers. 9-11 changed the way that we not only travel but also the way that we relate to each other. So much changed. When the internet came into our world, it brought with it a paradigm shift. So if you were a film company, Kodak, and you were stuck in your ways, you probably went in business just about maybe five years later because this world moved really, really fast. Do you know? that you and I have just experienced a paradigm shifting event. 19 months, 19 months of pandemic, 19 months of realizing that this one, this nation, the richest nation in human civilization, this one, the history of humanity, this nation is talking about the same thing that my home country, which is one of the poorest countries by GDP, one of the poorest countries in the world, is also talking about all at the same time. The pandemic didn't look at who is who. It 
because it is a paradigm shifting event. The gospel, the good news of Jesus, Pastor Jeremiah, mm -hmm. when we let it travel from here to here, I don't care how old you are, it shifts everything. Mm. I was a soccer player by profession. I loved it. <laughs> In fact, somewhere along the way, I talked to God and I said, anything, I, I'll do anything for you. Just don't never make me a pastor. <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> the gospel is a paradigm shifting God idea. The prophet Ezekiel in chapter 47, he, he gives us this metaphor. And it begins with the temple. And within the temple, there's this stream of water that runs by the altar and then goes out the, the south side over the threshold. And he describes this, this water as one that as... As it goes out, the further it goes, the, the deeper it gets and, and the wider it gets. But not only that, this, this water, which starts in the temple, this space where God and humanity meets, and it goes past the altar, the place of sacrifice. As, as it goes out and it goes out, it changes everything. It changes entire ecosystems. It says that as this water goes on, on dry, barren land, this, this land transforms. And we know that water is both destructive and creative. Mm. It creates pain sometimes. It, it, it can be messy, mm. but it also brings life. And, and as this metaphor plays out in, in Ezekiel, this, this water goes out and, and these places that had been given up as God forsaken, as dead, begin to come back to life. And trees begin to, to, to pop up on the shores of this river. And it, it ends with this river coming into the Dead Sea. And even the Dead Sea is transformed into a life-giving body of water. And that's, that's this power of, of God's life, of, of his word going out, his, his good news coming into and, and impacting and, and, and transforming people and places. And, and that's what we see in this, in this text of Ephesus. A man by the name of Paul who had been transformed by this water. Do you remember Paul? We're going to introduce him in, in Acts chapter 9. You guys remember this guy? Formerly Saul. We see him breathing out murderous threats against Christians, those who were, who were caught up in the way. He leaves fully intending on bringing them into jail. And he stopped. Blinded in his tracks, in his, his own paradigm shifting moment. And Jesus gives him this message, this, this good news. And it's summarized, we, we see it, it's summarized in, in Acts chapter 19. We don't get his full sermon. We get this short summary by Demetrius, and, and it's just this. The gods made by hands, those aren't gods. And let the hearer hear. The gods made by hands. Those are not gods. The things that, that we create. Well, what, if, what if that was the, only, the, the whole sermon? Maybe he did it that way. He just one came into a room. Gods that are not gods. That are made by hands are not gods. Bye. From the guy who <laughs> preached so long that a guy fell out a window because <laughs> he fell asleep. I don't know if he ever had a sermon that short. But he said, in summary, yeah. 
gods made by human hands are not gods at all. The things that, that we fashion and form, that we allow to take our affection and our attention, the things that, that we devote our, our schedules and, and our monies to, Paul says, be careful. Those things, those are not gods. They will, they will leave you empty and miserable and wanting even more. And that was his message as it, as it came into this city of Ephesus, and it began to change everything, including the economy. You have gods. You do. They, they stress you up. They keep you up at night. Here's the good news. They are not gods. The gods that are made by human imagination. Gods from Hollywood are not gods. <laughs> Just let that sink in. They're not gods. Because something might happen in your heart. That is a gospel thing. Mm. And when that fire leads like Moses describes the burning bush, you might find that this is a fire that lights and lights, but that never gets consumed. This is a God we're looking for. Mm. So in verse 23, about that time, there arose a great disturbance about the way because the, the gospel is disruptive. The gospel is disruptive. Let it be disruptive. We, we um, in fact... I just had, we, in, our, in our context in Linda Vista, we've created this little church, you know, it's a new church plant. And uh, this little church um, works with uh, youth in the neighborhood. We're both coaches in our neighborhood. So I coach soccer, God's beloved sport. He coaches football. Also God's beloved sport. It's fine. It's fine. Just that nobody else around the world gets it. You know, but, but, uh, but uh, yeah, so, so we, we, are, we are coaches. Why are we coaches? We didn't just kind of do that. And as coaches, we can coach anywhere. Why did we choose to coach in this neighborhood in an under-resourced town? Because the gospel is not only disruptive, but as you see it in the passage, the gospel is also an economic hypothesis. If it is not God over your budget, it is not God at all. If it is not God over your schedule, it is not God at all. And, and your schedule is stressing you out. And you're, but I tell my friends, my, you know, a, a couple of times I've tried to meet with my, my African friends. And we're trying to get together. And it doesn't work. And it does work here in America. And I was like, oh, you have been defeated by the American schedule. That's fine. Because <laughs> the American schedule is a God. <laughs> we go to like missions, places. And I'm saying that because I've lived here for almost 20 years. When I go to Malawi, oh, you worship that schedule, don't you? You know what I'm saying? It's like, oh, come on, guys. And everyone is like, chill out, bro. <laughs> what did they do to you? <laughs> you never used to be like this. Gods. Gods. The gospel, the good news is that it is disruptive. It needs to be rolled over your schedule. It needs to be rolled over your gratitude. It needs to be rolled over everything. I wonder what would happen if a, an individual consumed by what Jesus had done for them or a community consumed with what Jesus had done for them. I, I, wonder, I, I wonder what sort of evil institutions would be done away with. Great question. Would just lose their impact. In Ephesus, it was the silver industry. But I wonder if, if we began to, to take the love of Jesus seriously, what, what would happen to the foster care system here? I wonder what would happen to the adult entertainment industry. I wonder what would happen to the homeless community. I wonder what would happen to the, the crisis at the border. Like what what happens in communities when, when people are, are so gripped by the good news of Jesus 
that they begin to enact change, not just passively, but also actively by what they choose to spend their time and their resource on. What begins to happen when, when men and women of faith begin to live that out in the context of places like La Jolla or Linda Vista? I remember uh, not too long ago in, in March, like Knox said, I'm, I'm a football coach. Uh, right after one of our games, uh, one of our players, his name's Jiggy, uh, was racing home, clipped the car, and went head on into another car coming up at Genesee. Both Jiggy and the young lady, she was a USD student coming up the other way, they both died. And we were torn. You know, we didn't sign up. I got signed up to coach football, right? And all of a sudden, we're doing triage, emotional triage with, with these young men who have never been taught how to grieve properly. And as part of that process, Jiggy's family approached us and they said, uh, pastors, nobody will allow us to host Jiggy's memorial because we're too brown and we're too poor. We have too many gang members. So we got permission from the church that, uh, that, we, that we're hosted by. <laughs> and we knew we were in for it when you see this sea of red, like not maroon, but like blood red. Hundreds, <laughs> it's like coming up the street. We're like, oh, and with them carrying cases of beer. Or we're like starting to sweat like, oh. You know we are in church, right? <laughs> <laughs> These folks coming in. What is church? <laughs> uh, but to be able to share Jesus, to be able to share Jesus there with folks who have been turned away and who live their life with other people fearing them because of their tattoos or the color of their skin or the colors they choose to wear. We are allowed into that space to share the good news of Jesus. Just this last Sunday, <clears throat> maybe a few people are here that were a part of this experience, but a group from La Jolla came by to hang out with us. And in the way that we have kind of structured our ministry is that we have put tables ahead. Uh, we've put tables to lead, right? Tables lead. And so we, we have dinners together. And so uh, last week in the evening, as we are sitting at these tables and having dinner together, and our friends from here so graciously made amazing food for us, and we're enjoying that, I saw a lady from our neighborhood who sleeps at the front door of our church, so she's homeless, who is mentally ill, so she's in a place where she's over there in our society, in our town. I saw her come over, and for the first time in our long four-year relationship, she sat at the table and had dinner with everybody. Mm -hmm. The gospel is an economic hypothesis. We are saying maybe we, might, we can't for, uh, afford dinner. <laughs> we are living in a town where people can't give to the church because they don't have money legitimately. In fact, we stopped doing the offering bucket because of that reason. Because we saw as the bucket went from a middle class person into the hands of a homeless person, into the hands of another homeless person, we saw the shame that that brought. So we said, no, that ends tonight. That ends tonight. And so we are the gospel. And I can tell you, in just four years, I can tell you stories of Kenny who was just on the streets and just forgotten, who is being healed, who has a home now. I can tell you the story of Elaine, who at the end of last year, we were sending each other texts within the church and say, who is bothered by the fact that Mama Elaine, this African-American uh, Mateno leader of the community, has been homeless for so long? Who's bothered by that? And he, out of that text, we said, this is the year it ends. And so when I saw her the next morning, at the door of the church, she used to sleep where Kelly sleeps now. We took a picture together, and she said, what is that for? I said, this is your last night here. It was a gospel. And so Elaine is now in a home. And David, and stories of Angel, 
and Dixon who came when we were preaching like this. He walked over here looking super, super scary and interrupted our prayer time. Not in a good way, in a scary way. And the Lord said, take a step towards him. So I took a step towards him and we were praying. We were praying. He came back two, maybe two months later. And later on, he came with a poem that said, I came to disrupt but I want you to know that inside I was crying out. And so Dixon is being restored into our community now. And stories are everywhere of gospel. In fact, we got criticism at our location because of multiple entities meet, meet there. We got criticism where two different people that don't see each other, that don't talk to each other, say, yeah, you guys are disruptive. <laughs> And I was like, yeah, thank you. <laughs> that feels really great. Because they said, when you came here, all these homeless people came around. And they said, yeah, because <laughs> we're a church. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> I think that's the thesis of this series, Scent, right? Where it's both this identity where Jesus says, like, I'm, I'm going to clothe you in power. And we're going to start here, then I'm going to send you out. And as you go, not by your own giftedness or strengths or abilities, mm. but through the power of my name, mm. you will begin to lead people to me. Mm. And as people begin to do that, lives are transformed. And, and we, we just begin to dream, just like the, the little bumper video. Like as, as, as God continues to, to lead us, like, would, would our best spiritual days not be behind us? Like, we don't, we don't want to just ride on, on what has happened. We refuse to believe that, that those are our best spiritual days. We, we, we dare to dream that through, like, the gospel and, and its continued work in our neighborhood, mm-hmm. that we will be able to, to continue to minister to, to folks like Kelly and, and Dixon and, and members of, of sports teams and, and across the way. And um, as part of that, the, the encouragement, two things. One, going back to the Apostle John, who's here, who's in Ephesus, calls his people back. Do you remember that? Remember how we used to be? Not all the spiritual activity. Do you remember when we were so gripped by Jesus that we just could not help ourselves? That's what he calls them back to. And, and allow me to be so bold as to say, like some of us in this room need to be reminded that you have abandoned your first love. And nobody is impressed by your spiritual activity. And the second piece here is that God has sent you. And as, as he has placed you strategically in and around circles and communities, what is it? that he's going to do through you. And so finally, uh, I think we were supposed to speak for 25 minutes, and we are at 28, Sorry. so we're storing like three minutes and 47 That's seconds. still 30 here. minutes less than what we use. <laughs> In the American <laughs> schedule, time is money, I understand. But, but um, through the, the way that you guys hold each other here, Please, please, please don't take that for granted. Mm. Through the ways that you guys hold each other here, here's the next thing you're going to be able to do through us, because this ministry is a great support to us. In this next season, we're coming up, we we have created a thing called the the flower. The flower is a life economics leadership pipeline for the neighborhood. Because we recognize that the neighborhood is full of tired leaders. Why are they tired? Because most leaders in the neighborhood, in the nonprofit world, don't, they don't have Jesus' hypothesis that says, multiply yourself in people. That's a Jesus genius, by the way. That's a Jesus genius. And so because we have the Jesus genius, we understand that we have to multiply ourselves in people cross-generationally. Uh, the flower is uh, a leadership development pipeline that has seven petals. So if you can imagine gardening and gardening, where people are gardening together, we're doing urban gardening, and we're talking about leadership. In a space where we're talking about 
money and investing. What is money? How come the US dollar money, paper, is worth more than the Malawian kwacha or the peso? That makes no sense. They're all papers. All of them are green, whatever. Oh, let's talk about that. Let's talk about money. Let's talk about where people are investing. Where are people putting their money now? How can we, in this paradigm shift, not be left behind so that our young people in our neighborhood are stuck in the same poverty cycle that their parents and their grandparents were stuck in? We got to change that. Why? Because we have gospel energy. Gospel changes everything. So it's those petals, seven of them in the eighth one, we've left it blank. Because we want to see where, what the Holy Spirit might whisper to us. And so we've just called it prototypes, where we're going to follow whatever the, the Holy Spirit is going to do and experiment in those areas. But each one of those areas will have about 10 to 15 people creating in them. And so it, as you can imagine, it's probably about 100 leaders that when we are done with them, we can then look at them and say, listen, there's that organization right there. You four go here because your, your, your gifts fit there. You go over there. You, go, you guys go and coach. The 15 of you are now coaches in the neighborhood and so on and so forth. That's the next thing that we are putting legs towards. Gospel. Gospel. That's that. <laughs> For the young people that are here, I'm seeing you guys. Gospel does that. Mm. I challenge you to come back to me 10 years from now after you've looked at everything. I make you a promise. You won't find anything that is like the words of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Gospel. Mm. On behalf of our church, thank you. Yep, that's it. <laughs>